Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's special edition of The Robust Opposition. It's about factory farming in the United States and how it's pretty much totally replaced family farming. And I've got two very special guests with me today. You two are together in the airport right now in Minneapolis on your way out to Yale to speak about this topic, Fighting Factory Farms, the story of how two Midwestern family farmers stood up to the agriculture political industrial complex. This is sponsored by the Yale Animal Law Society, um, the Yale Food Law Society, the in Yale Environmental Law Association. Sonia, you are a founding member of Dodge County Concerned Citizens, which is a grassroots organization fighting factory farms in rural Minnesota and the upper Midwest. Chris is an independent hog farmer from Northern Iowa, and you also serve as a SRAP associate, which stands for Socially Responsible Agriculture Project. And this informs and educates the general public about the negative effects of concentrated animal feeding operations, CAFOs, also known as factory farms, while working directly with US communities impacted by this destructive form of industrial agriculture. So my first question to whichever one of you wants to answer this is to more specifically define a CAFO farm, how it's different from a family farm, and specifically how it affects animals, farmers, human health, and the environment. Family farm agriculture, for all you who wonder, 92% of us independent mid-sized small-scale family farms have disappeared off the map. We are being uh, replaced by large-scale outside big money corporate uh, industrialized agriculture who basically puts pigs in large warehouses on cement with manure pits under them. And there's not, in my mind, there's not too much to raising pigs that way. It's pretty simple, but what happens uh, the pigs are crowded. You got to give the hogs lots of antibiotics. Um, it's a very unsustainable system. Whereas the family farm, uh, we do it the traditional way. You know, the pigs are in bedding, uh, straw, and uh, animal welfare comes into a large play of how we treat the animals. Uh, you also asked about factory farms. So it's essentially a lot of these. Um, buildings that you see when you're out in rural Minnesota where our farm is located in southern Minnesota. These are large industrial operations. We have 11 swine factory farms in a three mile radius of our farm. People have no idea the seriousness of the problem in rural America and the concentration of these facilities and what it's doing to our water, to the air, and how it's damaging local communities. Speak to some of those uh, consequences. For example, our group, Dodge County Concerned Citizens, we worked with the Isaac Walton League last summer, 2017, and also 2018, to collect water samples in the Cedar River. The Cedar River actually starts at our farm. Our farm in Dodge County, Minnesota, is at the headwaters of the Cedar River. And we collected almost 500 water samples. And of those water samples, over 70% showed E. coli that were far in excess of state standards. Many of the readings were five times, 10 times, 20, and 30 times the state standards. So, and our farm, by the way, is just 23 miles or so from Austin, Minnesota, which is world headquarters of Hormel Corporation. So that's E. coli uh, that's going directly into the rivers and area streams. Uh, as to hydrogen sulfide, uh, we have another community group not too far from Dodge County in Goodhue County, and they did hydrogen sulfide testing. We have citizen groups that are tired of waiting for the regulators to come out into these rural areas um, and to address these problems. But we had a group in Goodhue County that purchased their own hydrogen sulfide meters. It's called a Jerome meter. They went out and tested the air and 
the reading for under Minnesota law is supposed to be at seven parts per billion. And they had readings as high as 56 parts per billion. Uh, so the air emissions include things such as methane, ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, and other dangerous gases. And no one is doing anything about these dangerous air emissions. We've been relegated in rural areas to second class citizens. We were there first. So my family, for example, has been on the farm for, we were some of the earliest settlers in the community. And my family's been on the farm for over 125 years. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that, the magnitude of the problem, because my understanding is at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, there were about 55,000 family farms. And that number has dwindled. Um, they're being all bought out by these CAFO farms um, in many cases, um, monopolization has affected this. We have, um, we have uh, five companies in big food. Now we have a lot of Chinese companies buying the American monopolies. Talk about how um, that has affected the farmer. I, I read the term in your, in your article, contract farmers. It almost sounds like sharecroppers in a way. Yeah, what, what's going on? We're not being bought out. We're being chased out. We're being ran out of business because the industry and big money want to control everything to do with food-wise. And all you consumers on the show need to realize that they want to feed you what they want to raise their way. It's not about family farms anymore and us taking care of the animals properly, us wanting to live in a healthy environment. Uh, a healthy neighborhood as far as health-wise. These, uh, the, the manure and, and everything else off these huge factory farms pollute our environment. And they don't, you know, I treat my animals with re respect till the day they go to the butcher shop or slaughter. Um, I frown upon the way factory farm raises animals. It's very inhumane. It's all about the money. And they, the vertical integrators, the people who own the animal, uh, own the slaughtering facilities, have big ties to uh, infrastructure, to the big retailers, the big box stores. Uh, the little family farmer, mid-sized family farmers, we're being thrown under the bus, and we do it better than they do. You know, I did a program last year with the Organic Consumers Association, who I've been working with for a long time. I've also been part of the Humane Farming Association since the early 80s when I discovered about how uh, milk-fed calves were treated. And I haven't eaten milk-fed veal since the 80s. So this has been going on for several decades. Uh, but in uh, Vermont, you know, you talk about the vertical in integration. Uh, glyphosate, which is the main ingredient in uh, Monsanto's Roundup, was found in several flavors of Ben and Jerry's ice cream. And so the consumer farming, the Organic Consumers Association was trying to get Ben and Jerry's to buy organic milk because they're the largest uh, purchasers of milk in Vermont. They don't buy organic. And as a result, the organic family, the organic milk dairy farmers are being squeezed out of business. And uh, because of this vertical integration, they can't sell their milk to any other, um, you know, pasteurizing place. So can you speak a little bit more to that? Yeah, um, regardless whether you're a family milk producer or a, or a uh, cattle feeder um, or a pork producer or whatever, um, the big industry, they're, like I said, they're throwing us under the bus. They don't want us you know, all comes back to open and fair and transparent markets where everybody has a chance to get a decent price out of the marketplace based on the quality of the product and, in my opinion, how it's raised and everything else. And, you know, the, the family farm and our way of business and our culture out here, which is being ruined, um, it's all about big money and big outsiders taking over. A family farmer, we won't give antibiotics to a pig unless it's definitely sick. And if you raise the animals right, you don't have to use the antibiotics. I don't use antibiotics. Whereas the industry, the pigs are so crowded and packed, 
they used the antibiotics overwhelmingly to prevent sickness. So you're getting a full dose of antibiotics every day. And yes, there is a withdrawal period before they're slaughtered, but still, it's not the way to raise livestock. I saw a documentary a number of years ago called King Corn, and it was basically about how uh, the obesity epidemic started with Earl Butts, who was Nixon's agriculture secretary. Because at that point, food was not subsidized. People used to spend 40 percent of their paycheck on food. It was pretty expensive. And he decided, well, you know, that's ridiculous. People shouldn't have to spend so much money on food. So they started subsidizing commodity crops like wheat and corn and soybeans. And as, as a result, uh, farmers were paid to overproduce. They ended up with all this corn. They turned it into this new product called high fructose corn syrup, which they put into all, you know, bottled, packaged, canned foods, anything but fresh food, which is why Michael Pollan says, eat food, not food products. And as a result, when I was in the 60s growing up, fat people were an anomaly. Now, 75% of Americans are overweight or obese. So can you speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a type of food, so-called food in my mind, that the industry is raising and wants us to meet because they make all kinds of money on it that way. You know, they're vertically integrated. You got to realize that they own the whole system where us family farmers sell into a system like the packing plants, the food processors, they get their cut economically and then it goes to retail. It's all separated out the way it used to be. So there was a lot more oversight in doing it the right way instead of the way it's done today. The other point I would add to that, Lauren, is that the antibiotics they discovered are actually a growth hormone. And so you can get your product, whether it's a pig or whatever, to market faster by feeding a constant diet of antibiotics because of the, the growth hormone. So, of course, those hormones end up in the meat. They're in our food supply. And so, of course, there's a problem with obesity. I also want to speak to um, organic because the organic standards are very squishy right now and people aren't certain they don't have a comfort level that when we, we say we're getting organic it's really organic or even if organic means that they're treating the the animals properly i will tell you my son was going to school in vermont a number of years ago and i went to a family farm by the side of the road a dairy farmer and he gave me quite the education he told me that horizon which was organic milk that i'd been buying for my children since they were born actually treated their animals very badly. They had them all, all those cows stuffed together. And he told me at the time that Organic Valley was a better company. So a number of years ago, I switched to Organic Valley. And then I found out they were supporting this measure to, uh, um, there's a, a grocery manufacturers association and then an organic grocery manufacturers association. And they were actually supporting the effort to stop GMO labeling. And once I found out that Organic Valley was participating in that, I stopped buying their milk also. So it's hard to know. And, and then a final point about organic versus not organic. My friends who are vegans say it really doesn't matter because the effect on the environment, how much uh, it costs to raise meat, how much a, a square footage of field you use to raise meat versus raising soybeans, for instance. And so they say any animal agriculture, even organic, even family farms, sustainably raised, humanely treated, are bad for uh, climate change. Can either of you speak to that? Well, the organic standards over the years, you know, the last couple of decades, the industry has worked to weaken the standards and loosen them up. There's a reason they do that, exactly what you're saying about wanting you know, organic milk and you're finding all this stuff out about it. And, you know, organics to some, yeah, okay, that's important. But I think what's far more important when the consumer is out there buying food, keep two things in mind, sustainable and local. In other words, know your farmer, know where it's coming from. You're going to get a far better product, a far healthier product for your family. And that really is the goal is to, to, 
become more reliant upon our good neighbors to feed us because then we know what we're eating and what's on our plate. You talk to anyone in Los Angeles, for example, I suspect most of these people have never been on a farm. They don't have a clue where their food comes from. And yet most of the food that's sitting on that plate has been provided or produced by a great big corporation and part of their vertical integration uh, model. So you, you don't agree that animal agriculture just in general may be something whose time has come simply because of the climate change reasons and it's just so much less impactful as far as greenhouse gases to be uh, vegan? Well, there certainly is the, the aspect uh, with respect to animal agriculture and the methane levels and so forth. I mean, it certainly is a big contributor to climate change and we recognize that. But you have to remember the way that these animals are raised is contributing to greenhouse gases and climate change. These are animals that are raised above a manure pit. So the 11 swine factory farms near my parents' farm are all raised above a manure pit, directly above a manure pit. That's not how we used to raise. And that's certainly not how Chris raises his pigs. And so just the way that these animals are raised is contributing significantly to climate change. Okay, now let me ask you about how you've been fighting back. Uh, Sonia, let's start with you first and talk about the harassment that you faced as a result of fighting back. So my parents filed their first lawsuit in May of 2014, so four and a half years ago. We discovered almost immediately that the harassment and intimidation. It was garbage in our ditches, garbage in our driveway, uh, vehicles that would pull into our farmyard. Um, eventually it was uh, harassing phone calls, harassing <coughs> phone calls to my father who's in his, eight lady, in his late 80s, questions such as, have you changed yet? Those were calls that would come at midnight um, bullet holes in the stop sign just a few hours after my, after my brother and I were at the pulling out weeds just a few feet from the stop sign. Pure Roundup, we know how damaging Pure Roundup is. Pure Roundup was sprayed just a few weeks within days after we filmed the dark side of the other white meat. It was payback because they're trying to silence us. And so to be honest, people need to know that we went to the press not to grab headlines, but for our own safety. And so some of the harassment, intimidation, quite honestly, that we're seeing at a national level, this has been perfected in the rural areas for years. There are calls to employers, calls to local businesses. Chris and I work with a number of people around the United States who can tell you similar stories of harassment and intimidation. Uh, we're not alone. And how have the authorities, let's talk about the authorities from all, um, from the top down, because I did a show with Carrie Gilliam last year who wrote a book on Monsanto and how they have known that glyphosate is carcinogenic for a long time, but how they have so captured these regulatory industries, such as the U.S. Agriculture Department, the um, a Federal Drug Administration, and the EPA. Um, every She did a really exhaustive book. She was a reporter for Reuters, and then she stopped to write this book on this. So how have you tried to deal with the situation with these agencies that are supposed to protect us, or even the police department in your local communities? Because we know when, um, you know, the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe tried to protect their uh, water from being contaminated by the Dakota Access Pipeline, the police and the authorities came in and they, you know, protected the, you know, the pipeline owners, not the people. In fact, they sprayed them with, you know, pepper spray and water hoses and sound cannons. Talk about the authorities on every level and what they've done to try to help you or hurt you. The problem out here in rural Iowa, rural Minnesota, South Dakota, whatever, uh, oversight and regulation is really watered down. It's in the best interest of uh, the industry who sets in the state houses and makes these, ask these, you know, as lobbyists, ask these legislators to make laws to have loose standards so they can keep doing what they're doing. 
That's the basis of the whole thing. And the minute that we as citizens try to take action, such as doing our own hydrogen sulfide testing, going out and collecting water samples to check for E. coli, um, of course, the industry tries to scoot around the back end and hurry up and change the standards if they can, so that you have to understand that uh, from the local level to the national level, big ag is exempted from a number of the statutes that would otherwise protect local citizens. And, and you know, very important part of it, they have poisoned our functioning government to watch out for the citizens in rural areas, whether it's in the environment or culture, you know, the siting of these things, where they're going to put, put them, our health, all these issues, they're compromised. We're being invaded out here by the industry. There's, a, there's an economic term called regulatory capture, and that has happened. It is continuing to happen where the industrial giants are going in and essentially taking control of our governmental bodies and limiting, prohibiting the EPA, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, the Minnesota DNR, some of the other agencies, the Iowa DNR, from doing their jobs. Well, I did a panel on the corporatocracy when I was involved with Occupy LA, and we talked about Citizens United, we talked about regulatory capture, we talked about, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, Alec and the Koch brothers and how they are taking over the universities and they're, they're having their studies that are all slanted in their favor. I mean, it really seems like the deck is stacked against the little guy, against the citizen. And of course, Chris, you were a delegate for Bernie Sanders, as was I. And because the Democratic Party, the DNC, the corporate mainstream media foisted Hillary on us, we now have Trump. I was wondering if you could talk to um, how Trump has changed the situation, specifically with regard to the tariffs. And also, I want to mention some things that he said um, yesterday. He said he spoke to a, a farming association and um, he said, oh, we're helping the farmers because we're opening up new markets. We're getting rid of job killing regulations. We're ending oppressive federal intr intrusions. We're cutting taxes and we're making ethanol part of the energy future. And those were some of the things he said. So can you address Trump, uh, his energy, his agriculture secretary, Sonny Perdue, the heads of his 15 agencies are all dedicated to dismantling the agencies and eliminating and re regulations and not enforcing other regulations. So speak to the Trump administration, the tariffs, and um, ha have, have things gotten worse under him? So with respect to uh, the Trump presidency, in my opinion, you're gonna be surprised at this comment. I think it's the best thing that ever happened to this country because it shows how serious things are and because what you're seeing finally on a national basis is what we've been enduring for years in rural communities. And it's a huge wake up call to the entire United States. Yeah, we, we have a choice here going down the road in the next decade or two with the age of the farmers and everything else being taken into account here. We're going to have a choice as a country, as consumers, whether we want to go down the road of industrialized agriculture and, you know, animal agriculture and real crop agriculture, whatever else, or we're going to have family farm agriculture. Who, let me remind everybody, since 1776 has fed this country healthy fruit raised in an appropriate way. We want to continue. We need your support and your help. I've been putting up the Facebook groups of both of your, I mean, the Facebook pages of both of your groups uh, periodically throughout the show. Uh, I understand that a lot of young people don't want to go into the farming profession. A lot of family farmers are unable to interest their children in taking over the family business, so to speak. And uh, it's also extremely hard. It's very labor intensive. Um, even a lot of families don't necessarily want their kids to, to be working with their hands. They want them to be working in the knowledge industries. Uh, what is your experience with that? 
you know, beginning farmers, okay, we'll loan you a million bucks or a million and a half or $2 million if you want to raise animals for a fee. In other words, you pay for the building, you're paid a fee to raise animals for a big packer, Smithfield, Hormel, whoever. And that's massive debt. Those kids are caught with that debt forever. I look at it kind of like the college debt these kids have in town coming out of college. It's forever over your head. You never get out of debt. And to me, that's not a way to start a beginning farmer. And let me remind you, unless these loans are guaranteed, the family farm is mortgaged to put up these buildings. In other words, the dirt is used as collateral, the family farm. To me, this is totally wrong. The other way to go is open and transparent markets based on supply and demand, where sometimes hogs are worth really good money. Other times the market's flat now, but it corrects itself in supply and demand. That's what we've always had until this industry came along, you know, 20 years ago and started all this. Um, I'm putting up a quote here by Brian Cheeseman, who says, local urban gardening and neighborhood co-ops is the future of food production. And I have to say that, you know, I agree with Small is Beautiful. It's a book I read in the 1970s, and I really feel like right now we have this crazy situation in California where they ship live chickens to China and then they slaughter them, they package them, and then they send them back to the United States for sale. I mean, that is just ridiculous. The climate footprint of all this shipping is unsustainable. It just requires too much, you know, fossil fuels. So I personally feel like I remember South Central LA, well, I don't remember South Central LA, but I know that South Central LA used to have farms it used to have slaughterhouses, and food was grown locally, processed locally, and sold locally. Do you think that in this age of globalism, we can get back to that, and should we get back to that? The whole concept of a food shed, which is everything is within 150 miles. You just described family farm agriculture and the type of system we used to have in rural America. It's all being compromised now by big outsiders with lots of money. The answer is yes, it can happen. And, and secondly, it absolutely should happen because we cannot afford as a nation, either economically or politically, to allow just a handful of large corporations to control our food supply. It's not safe. How do you think uh, people can best help? Do you want them boycotting this big food, you know, uh, food from big food? Do you want them only buying organic? Uh, what can they do if they don't live in farm um, states or farm communities? How can they help you as activists, as consumers, as citizens? Tell us everything that you want viewers to do after they watch this show. Well, a whole bunch of things you can do at the grocery store, ask for local food, sustainable food, uh, organics, if that's your game. Um, vote. This is the voting season. Ask your candidates, ask your politicians. Lean on them real hard of what's going on out here in the Midwest, because you all have a part of this. You all eat. And the healthier you are, the longer you're going to live. And I would say vote with your fork. What we eat is very powerful. And so go to your local food co-op and really get a sense of where is the, what's the source of that food. We didn't get a chance to talk about the courts, if there's going to be any help there. I know with uh, Carrie Gillum, we talked about the Monsanto case. And a gentleman just won something like $750 million from them. Of course, the appeals court cut down the, the award. Um, because of glyphosate causing his cancer, which is a game changer. Uh, do you think there's anything that can happen in the courts? Um, are there any cases coming up that we can be hopeful about? The people I run with, a lot of us have had tried the political stuff over the last 20, 30 years, and we have made some inroads, but the politicians aren't listening. So then you go to the courts and I think there's going to be some surprises down the road, especially lawsuits against big uh, cable operators like what's going on in North Carolina. There's been some huge settlements out there. 
that's a warning shot across the bow to big food and, and big corporations. But is there any um, anything, any legislation coming up that they can write their representative about um, that affects this issue? Food and Water Watch is pressing for a nationwide moratorium on factory farms. Uh, the same thing is happening in the state of Iowa and in the state of Wisconsin. They are pushing for a moratorium on factory farms. Um, and also, um, Senator Booker out of New Jersey is uh, pressing for a legislative change with respect to all of these consolidations, especially in the ag sector. Yeah, and in the state of Iowa, we, we got a, you know, moratorium. What it actually is, is a uh, moratorium building. We're trying to, moratorium, trying to get passed through the state legislature and legislature. And we got, you know, over a quarter of the counties in Iowa now supporting something like that. So we are starting to be heard, but I just hope it's not too late. I want to thank you both for being on. Your picture kind of got frozen this last couple of minutes. Keep up the good work fighting for your uh, local farmers and for all of us. I'd like to ask people to share this show in different Facebook groups that they're part of. Uh, this evening, I'm going to be going to a uh, protest or maybe a vigil in Westwood in front of the federal building regarding the uh, shooting yesterday um, at the synagogue in Pittsburgh. Tomorrow, I'm going to be doing a program from a fundraiser for Public Bank LA, uh, which is a cause that I've been supporting since 2013. And it's going to be on the ballot uh, to change our city charter so that the city can actually operate a public bank. Tuesday, I'm going to be doing a show with Greg Pallast and hopefully Stacey Hopkins from Georgia about the voter suppression that Brian Kemp, the Secretary of State, has instituted. It took something like 350,000 people off the rolls, and he's also running for governor. So it's a terrible conflict of interest that he's the Secretary of State and also a gubernatorial candidate. And Greg Palast has been doing some great reporting on all the various states. I think there's seven or nine states where they've been suppressing the vote, and he's actually got lists from all those states, uh, so you can check to see if your name has been removed from the rolls, and if so, to re-register before uh, the election on Tuesday. If you're first following me for the first time, you can uh, follow me here on Facebook. <clears throat> you can follow me on Twitter. My handle is Lauren underscore Steiner, and you can subscribe to my YouTube channel where I upload most of these shows so until you next see me, which will be later this evening, keep fighting.